it is good to have everyone with us. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. I hope you've been made to feel at home. We have a wonderful church family here, and uh, just hope that you really have been welcomed here. And uh, Once again, thank you to our veterans for the sacrifice that all of you have made. You know, as a preacher, your hope is always that you will say something, your audience will hear it, and then they will respond to it. And sometimes as a preacher, that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it happens quicker than you might think that it will, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you might expect. Um, I said something last week, and um, somebody has responded to it. And probably the quickest response I've ever seen somebody um, make to something that I've said from the pulpit. Last week I said that my clock was broken. Somebody fixed my clock. Um, somebody was awfully concerned about how long we were going to go. Um, so I, I guess every once in a while you just don't know what people are going to respond to, but uh, God bless you. Um, we've been in the middle of a series together called Life in the Holy Spirit. We've been looking at the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives um, and how we might, as Christians, live more and more every day um, empowered and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so the, we have looked at that from several different uh, perspectives, and we are going to continue to do that today. I've got several things that I've got planned to talk on, and it seems like my sermons keep getting longer and longer um, as I, I plan for these things. So we may cover the whole sermon today. It's also a very good chance that halfway through we'll just stop. And we will pick that back up next week. Um, so what that will require of you is that if you are here this morning, you will have to be back next week. Um, so plan to do that. Um, we're going to be in John chapter 3 um, here in just a few minutes. If you want to go ahead and turn there, John chapter 3, to where our scripture reading came from this morning. We'll be looking at that passage as well as a few others. But before we get started, let's go ahead and have a prayer together. Holy Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to be together, to lift you up and to praise your name. And Father, we pray that the things that we have done here this morning, the songs that, uh, that we have sung together, the, the words that have been spoken, have brought glory and honor to you and have shown light on, on how wonderful of a God you are. God, you are the one and only true God we praise you for that. Father, today we are mindful of the many in our country who have made that sacrifice to, um, to serve our country and to lay their lives on the line to protect our country. And we thank you for those men and women who have done that. We thank you for the men and women that stood before us just a moment ago within our own congregation that have um, fought for our country. And we pray that we never take their sacrifice for granted. Father, we are also mindful of the ultimate sacrifice that your son made for us. That he came to this earth and, and lived this life. He went to the cross and gave himself up to die for us. We thank you that he overcame the grave. Father, help us to live daily mindful of that sacrifice that you made. Father, right now we pray that as we are um, have your spirit poured out on us, that we will open ourselves up to your spirit and that your spirit will come within us and empower us to live more and more for you today and to look more and more as you would have us to be, Father. We love you so much, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've uh, shared this story with you before. I'm going to share it with you again because I, I think it's a good story. Um, Chaim Potok was a Jewish author and rabbi in the 20th century. And he was a very intelligent man. He knew from a very early age that he wanted to be a writer. But one day he, he went off to college and his mother pulled him aside and, and she said, Kaim, I, I know you want to be a writer, but I have a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon? She said, you'll, you'll keep a, a lot of people from dying and you'll make a lot more money. And Kaim replied, no, mama. He said, I, I want to be a writer. And when Kaim returned home for his first break from school, his mom pulled him aside and, and said, Kaim, I, I know you want to be a writer, 
but I have a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon instead? You'll make a lot more money, and you'll keep a lot of people from dying. And he said, no, Mom, I want to be a writer. And this would happen each and every time that Kaim would return home from school. His mom would pull him aside, and she'd say, Kaim, I know you want to be a writer, but I have a better idea. Why don't you be a brain surgeon instead? You'll make a lot more money, and you'll keep a lot of people from dying. And each time he would reply, no, Mama, I want to be a writer. And as that pressure and that irritation mounted on both sides, finally, Kaim's mother exploded and, and said, Kaim, you're, you're wasting your time. Be a brain surgeon. You'll make a lot more money, and you'll keep a lot of people from dying. And Kaim replied, Mama, I don't want to keep people from dying. I want to show them how to live. John chapter 3, we have this story, the nighttime visitor that comes to speak to Jesus. And I remember this story well from my childhood because of the amount of times that we would maybe quote a verse from there that you're familiar with in John 3.16. I remember from my childhood being in the, the Bible Bowl at church camp, and almost every year there would be a trivia question about this story. What was the name of the man that came to Jesus at night? And that would be one of the, one of the questions we would, have to, uh, we would have to respond to, and the answer was Nicodemus. I remember times when we would speak about in class and kind of postulate about why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? And there's so many different ways that you could look at that, but yet we really just don't know for sure. And maybe we make too much of it at times. Maybe it was just simply the most convenient time for Nicodemus. But what has often been overlooked in this passage, I think, is why did Nicodemus come to Jesus? Not why did he come at night. Not who was he, but just simply why did he come? Why did he come to Jesus? And as he spoke to Jesus that night, what was it that drove their conversation? We pick up the story in John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. You see, in this passage, we are introduced to this man, Nicodemus. We're told that he is a member of the Jewish ruling council. The Jewish ruling council, what they're talking about is the Jewish Sanhedrin here. The Sanhedrin were the 70 men who were put in charge to rule over the Jewish people. And Nicodemus is one of these 70 men as part of that Sanhedrin. Verse 10, which we won't look at too much today, but verse 10, Jesus refers to Nicodemus as Israel's teacher. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus was a ruler over Israel. He was one of Israel's teachers. And normally that would mean that Nicodemus was a fierce enemy of Jesus. That he was the type of man that would come and, and would challenge Jesus. But Nicodemus, rather than coming to challenge Jesus, comes this one night searching for Jesus, trying to find out exactly who this Jesus is. He says, Rabbi, think about that for a moment. A lot of people call Jesus Rabbi, but this was one of the Jewish rabbis. This was one of the, the Jewish Sanhedrin. For Nicodemus to call Jesus Rabbi, this was a, a high praise from Nicodemus. Nicodemus calling Jesus Rabbi meant a little bit more than just anybody else calling Jesus Rabbi. What Nicodemus was saying was that you are, are one of us. We are on equal uh, footing here. And you know, Obviously, Nicodemus is not equal to Jesus, but most of those people thought Jesus isn't equal to us. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. He comes and he makes this great ex, uh, expression of faith to Jesus. And he says, we know that you come from God. We've seen the signs, and we know that no one could do these things if God weren't with them. It's this, this great compliment to Jesus. And you would almost expect for Jesus to look back at him and say, Nicodemus, thank you. 
Thank you for recognizing what it is that I'm doing. Thank you for, for coming to me and, and stepping out. You know, I, I realize the, the predicament that you are putting yourself in and the way that you might be isolating yourself from the other 69 Sanhedrin because you are coming to me and you are recognizing me as, as God. You might expect that Jesus would praise Nicodemus for these comments. But we pick up in verse 3, and it just says, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. We read this passage, and, and where it comes up in, in the book, and we almost wonder, did, did somebody skip a page when they were maybe making this copy for us? Have we missed something? Is there more to this story that we just don't know about? Why is Jesus responding to Nicodemus in this way? He seems almost to not even address what it is that Nicodemus has said. And he just says, very true, I, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus confronts Nicodemus with this statement. Nicodemus hears this, this comment. No one can, can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And Nicodemus is confused, so he looks at Jesus and he says, Wait, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus is confused. What does Jesus mean by that? He's thinking on very physical terms. You know, how, how can an old man suddenly enter back into his mother's womb and, and, and go through the process of being born again? How can this be, Jesus? And Jesus answered him by saying, Very true, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. He said, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. He said, You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he tells him that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. You see, what Jesus does here is he introduces this concept of baptism into the, his discussion with Nicodemus. Now, water baptism, Nicodemus would have been familiar with. He would have understood what, what Jesus meant by, by water baptism. Maybe even he has experienced a water baptism before, as, as many of the people who have come to John the Baptist have experienced. But why does, why does Jesus say this now? You see, this idea that Jesus would look at this Jewish ruler and tell him that he needs to be born of water and spirit. It's I don't know, it's an intriguing idea. It's a confusing idea, at the very least, for Nicodemus. But it may have been more than that. It may have even been insulting to Nicodemus for Jesus to say this to him. Why? Bruce McClarty said this in, in his commentary on John. He said, Baptism before the time of Jesus' ministry was commonly practiced in Judaism when a Gentile made the decision to become a Jew. And the three actions necessary to become a Jew or a proselyte were circumcision, sacrifice, and baptism. So he says, to suggest that a leading member of the Jewish Sanhedrin needed to be baptized was just unthinkable. Jesus insisted that entering the kingdom of God was not a matter of keeping all the rules. It was a matter of having a heart that would humble itself before God and allow the Holy Spirit to change it and make it new. What Jesus has told Nicodemus may very well have been insulting. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. What does he mean by that? And why does, why this conversation? Why has Jesus responded to Nicodemus' comments of, of faith and just admiration? I tell him he needs to be born again. 
And why does he call him out on, on saying that he needs to be born of water and the Spirit? You see, here's what I think is going on here. Nicodemus comes to Jesus as a ruler of the Jewish people. He's someone who has been put in charge of making sure that everyone is keeping the, the laws of Moses, making sure that everybody is living just perfectly in accordance with what is, is being taught, that no one's making any mistakes, and he's trying to clean up all the messes. And, and he comes to, to Jesus, and he begins to praise Jesus, and Jesus calls him out for what's going on in his life. He, he tells Nicodemus, he says, you need to be born again. Why? Because, you see, Nicodemus had become so concerned in his life with trying to keep all the rules, trying to keep all the law. And what he did, and that what any of the people who were trying to work so hard and just making sure they were keeping the laws, keeping the rules, if, if that was their sole focus and that's why they lived, what were they doing? They weren't trying to live, but rather they were just trying to keep from dying. And Jesus looks at him and says, Nicodemus, I don't want you to keep from dying. I want you to live. You see, what Nicodemus didn't understand was that in this process of trying to keep from dying, he was already dead. Not, not a, a physical death, but a spiritual death. He was dead. And at this point, there was just no point in him trying to continue to keep from dying because he couldn't get any more dead than what he was. And so Jesus looks at him, and he says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And he says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh. Nicodemus understands that. But he says, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. What does he mean by that? What does Jesus mean when he tells Nicodemus that the spirit gives birth to spirit? To answer this question, I want us to go back to an Old Testament passage. In the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 37, Ezekiel is... is sharing the, this prophecy, and it's this story that, that, if you've been in church for very long, maybe you've heard this story before. And Ezekiel is, is writing this prophecy, and he says, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He, what Ezekiel says is that the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and he takes him into the middle of this valley. And in this valley, he looks around, and there's just bones everywhere. Just dead bones. The skeletons of, of, of people who have lived before but were no longer living. And it's not even that they're laid out in, in these nice, you know, already formed skeletons where maybe you could put them back together somehow. It's just stacks of bones everywhere. There's no life in them. He says, I see all of these bones on the floor of the valley. He says, bones not that were just dry, but bones that were very dry. He says, you couldn't get any more dead than these bones. And then at the beginning of verse 3, he says that the Spirit of the Lord looked at him and said, Son of man, can these bones live? You think about that if you're Ezekiel. How do you respond to that question? There's just, there's no good response. You know, maybe, I mean, if, if I'm Ezekiel, I'm thinking, no, there's not a chance. Not, not a, a, a chance at all that these bones can live. But you're talking to the Spirit of the Lord. You're not going to say, not a chance. But what, what, what do you say? And so Ezekiel comes up with this great response, and he says, um, Sovereign Lord, you know. He puts it back on him. He said, I'll tell you, you tell me. Can these bones live? Sovereign Lord, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, Ezekiel says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and, will, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. 
I want you to think about this. The Spirit of the Lord comes to, on, on Ezekiel and says, I want you to prophesy to him. I want you to preach to him. What do you mean, God? We're going to prophesy. I just preach to him. Now, I'm a, I'm a preacher, and I've been asked to preach in some situations where I'm thinking, well, I don't know how well these people are going to respond to me. What do you do if you're Ezekiel? And he says, go preach to dead bones. I, I've preached to some crowds before that weren't much more than that. <laughs> but he says, preach to these dead bones. And, and so Ezekiel says, well, what do I do? I preached. I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, as I was preaching, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Ezekiel is preaching to this valley of just dead bones, and the bones start moving. Every preacher wants an audience like that. <laughs> Every preacher wants the dead bones to start moving a little bit. And so the Spirit of the Lord said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live and so he said, I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Ezekiel begins to not just preach to the bone, but then he begins to preach to the breath. And it says the breath came from the four winds, and it, it breathed into to these dead bones, and they began to live. How are y'all feeling? It's time for me to quit, but I don't want to. Let's go. I want us to think about this word for a second. Everybody say this with me. Ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to say it just like that. Ruach. Ruach. <laughs> you see, it's the Hebrew word. And uh, I think it was uh, Jeff Walling said that uh, if there's not a little bit of spit on the person's neck in front of you, you didn't get that last part quite right. <laughs> Ruach. You see, this is the word that we see in this passage. It's at times translated wind, it's at times translated breath, at times mind, at times spirit. Ruach. I want you to read through this passage with me again, and, and when we get to, to the times where we see this word, I've, I've noted those for you. I want you to say those with me. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the spirit. The what? Ruach of the Lord, and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, then you will know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Let's think about this together. You see, here's what Ezekiel says, verse 10. He said, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath, the ruach, uh, ruach <laughs> entered them. And they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. He said, so I prophesied as he. Who's the he? The Spirit of the Lord. I prophesied as the Ruach of the Lord commanded me. And the Ruach entered them. I prophesied as the Spirit told me to prophesy, and when I did that, the Spirit entered them. And when the, spent, when the spirit, when the ruach entered to these dry bones, what 
happened. They came to life. And they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Go back to John chapter 3 with me. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Nicodemus, Nicodemus asks, How can someone be born when they are uh, old? And uh, he says, Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And he said, you should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, what Jesus looks at Nicodemus and tells him is this. You have been trying your whole life not to die. But you're not living. And so he says, if you need to live, you need to not just be born of water, you see, being born of water was, was a, a cleansing. It, it was a way of saying, I, I'm, I'm repenting of my past. I, I'm, I'm cleansing. I'm getting rid of the old sins. But let me ask you this. If you get rid of all of your old sins, and let's be honest. We all want that, right? We all want forgiveness. We all want to put away the past. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's not just about putting away the past. Because if you put away the past, but you don't change who you are, what's going to happen? The past is going to come right on back. And so he says, you need to not just be born of water, you also need to be born of the Spirit. You need to have the Spirit in you. And when you have the Spirit in you and you move forward, you can finally begin to live. And then he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. Now, in the New Testament, I don't have this up here. In the New Testament, the word for spirit can also be the word for wind, can also be the word. It's just like the Old Testament. All those same words could be translated, same word. Spirit, wind, breath. Um, I forget what else I had up there. But it's not ruach. It's a, it's a New Testament word. It's a Greek word. It's the word pneuma. And so Jesus says, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind, or the pneuma, blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the pneuma. You see, do we see the wind? So it's kind of a trick question. We, you can't see the wind, can you? But we can see the effects of the wind, can't we? see any area that's been torn apart by a hurricane or a tornado, you can see the effect of the wind. Of the wind. Look at, at a tree. A, a tree by its very nature should just stand there, but at times we see the leaves begin to move. We see the branches begin to bend a little bit. Why is that? Because something that we can't see is moving it in ways that are not natural to us. The wind is moving the tree. He says, when you're born again, the pneuma blows where it pleases. And you hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone who is born of the pneuma. When we are born of the Spirit, when we have the Spirit living in us, we're going to do some unnatural things. And people are going to wonder, why, why is that happening? It's because what they're seeing in us is not actually what we're doing. It's what the Spirit that is living in us. The Spirit will move us in new ways. But for us to begin to do that, the Spirit needs to breathe life into us. The Spirit needs to be the life that transforms us and pushes us and empowers us. You see, he went on and said, how can this be? And Nicodemus asked, you are Israel, uh, and Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher. And, and do you not understand these things very truly? I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And it, it says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You see, what, what Jesus begins to tell Nicodemus is that if you believe in God, if you believe in what Jesus is doing, then you can have that eternal life. See, a little bit later in John chapter 7, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You see, what Jesus is saying is that those who believe in him will eventually have it will eventually receive the Spirit. Later they will receive the Spirit, and it will be like rivers of living water will flow within them. They will have life within them because the Spirit will be in them, living in them. But he said up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. You see, later on, Jesus would be glorified. You see, in John 3, Jesus said, like, that like Moses raised the serpent up in the wilderness, so Jesus may, must also be, the Son of Man must also be raised up. He must also be glorified. And eventually, though when it seemed like at all people were glorifying Jesus when they raised him up on the cross and put him, he was in fact being glorified. And so when we get to this day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and, and Peter and the rest of the apostles are preaching to all of Israel, they're saying basically, listen to this. Let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, whom you raised up, whom you glorified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They believed what they heard about the, about the Jesus that was glorified, and they said, What do we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. If you want to believe then repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for, for the forgiveness of your sins, the baptism of water, the cleansing of your sins, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise isn't just for you. This promise is for you, and it's for your children, and it's for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You see, if you go back to... Um, to John chapter 3, and I, I don't have this here. I'm looking through my notes here. Um, John chapter 3, he says, um, boy, I wish I could find it. I need to bring this back to you next week so that I can show this to you. But in John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus that you, singular, must be born again. But then, as he transitions, he tells them, you all. He changes the word from the singular you to the plural you to tell them that everyone, all of you, need to be born of water and the Spirit. And so when we get to Acts chapter 2, what does Peter say? It's not just for you. It's for all of you. The baptism, the, the born of water, and the born of the Spirit. And so church, as we begin to live life in the Holy Spirit, you know what we're actually finding? The Holy Spirit is living life in us. And when we begin to live this life and embrace that Spirit, and, and, and we uh, live life born of